When Mary was very young, she loved fairy tales. At first, her mother read her books, but then she learned to read on her own, and every time Mary believed that a real fairy tale would happen in her life. And then it turned out that dreams come true, but her fairy tale turned out to be a terrible one. First, her mother died. It was so unfair that it just didn't make sense in Mary's little head. What? No more mom? Everyone else has won, and she doesn't? Even the weird Charles has won, even the imaginative Lauren, although her mother is not young or beautiful at all. Mary couldn't believe back then that her mom wouldn't enter the house again, wouldn't make a delicious breakfast, and they wouldn't roll around in bed together, playfully pillow fighting. It seemed to her that everyone around was pretending and hiding the fact that was so clear to her if her mom didn't die, she was enchanted by an evil witch and fell into a fairy tale sleep. When she asked her dad to wake up her mom, he cried. And then, a year later, another woman appeared in the house. This is Aunt Emily, explained Mary's dad. She will be your new mom. No, Mary replied, backing away from the smiling aunt. I don't need any new mom. Of course you do. Dad grabbed his daughter and pulled her closer. Emily is good with kids. She's a teacher. I'm sure you'll become friends. Not for anything, declared Mary. She should leave. And then, for the first time in her life, her dad slapped her. It didn't hurt, but it was very hurtful. Mary spent the whole day in her room, crying. And when hunger drove her out of hiding, Aunt Emily said that she would only get food if she called her mom. That evening, the tearful girl went to sleep hungry. Contrary to her expectations, her father didn't send the evil witch away, and soon she became the full-fledged mistress of the house. So everything followed the plot of a fairy tale about a stepmother and a poor stepdaughter. Even the fact that her father got sick. He suffered for a long time, the illness consumed him from the inside, and it was frightening for 12-year-old Mary to see him like that, emaciated, pale, with the four needle protruding from his hand. I'm going to die soon, her father said one day, very simply and matter-of-factly. He thought he could handle it, that he could live without her, but it didn't work out. Forgive me, Emily, it seems I'm a one-woman man. Keep living, I beg you, Mary, don't leave. What are you talking about, my love? Of course, I won't leave. The new wife held his hand, but for some reason, Mary knew it was a lie. And then, her father passed away, and it turned out that he had left all the money to his daughter. Aunt Emily became her guardian. At first, she dipped into the girl's funds discreetly. Then, feeling complete impunity, she went all out. It didn't take half a year for the widow to find a new husband, young and brash with a fitness trainer's physique. Mary increasingly locked herself in her room so as not to hear or see them. Or she went out to wander the city. She did well in her studies. Her teachers had no complaints about her. She dressed neatly, but she never went on class trips. Most people thought she was just very introverted, and nobody bothered her with questions. However, the real reason was different. Mary had no money, not even pocket money, let alone asking for a large sum for a trip from her stepmother. Mary endured and waited for the day when she could claim her inheritance rights and leave the house that had ceased to be her home. Things got even worse when her stepmother decided that her young husband was paying too much attention to the 12-year-old stepdaughter. She constantly watched them, caused scenes. And one day, unable to control herself, she struck Mary with a hot frying pan. The girl managed to shield herself with her hand, leaving a burn mark. An already bitter life turned into a nightmare. Mary would never forget the day when the enraged stepmother grabbed her and dangled her over the balcony rail, threatening to throw her from the seventh floor. 
Staring into the crazed eyes of the mad woman, Mary screamed and screamed until her stepmother's husband ran out and restrained her. Mary gasped for air, clutching her throat with her hands, but for some reason, only hoarse sounds came out. She didn't yet know that her voice had disappeared completely. In the evening, huddled under the covers, Mary overheard snippets of conversation through the wall. What have you done? Her husband yelled at her. Now she'll definitely go to the police and spill everything. You've really messed up. Sit down, you idiot. Say goodbye to the sweet life on that kid's money, and hello to prison. How foolish do you have to be to mess up so badly? She won't go, the stepmother suddenly declared. I'll handle it all. What else have you planned? The clearly frightened man shouted. Remember, I won't sign up for anything like that. I know because you're a coward. The stepmother responded coldly. I'll take her away to the countryside to my granny, as if for some fresh air and recovery. It's a remote place, and all sorts of people can be encountered there. Plus, there's a deep river nearby anything can happen. I haven't heard of that, the man said. Mary stopped listening further. Her ears were ringing, her heart pounding wildly. What to do? Go to the police like this, without a voice? She couldn't even explain what had happened. She could write it down on paper, but her stepmother would just deny it, saying there were no witnesses. A little girl couldn't fabricate enough to implicate an honest woman. So, she would take her to the wilderness and dispose of her. She needed to make a decision. In the morning, her stepmother ordered Mary to get ready. Her voice still hadn't returned, so she couldn't call for help. Aunt Emily packed her things into a big bag, including her documents. With each passing minute, Mary became more terrified. I'll run away along the way, she decided to herself. Her stepmother drove her out of the city, and they traveled through completely unfamiliar places. Mary had never been in this area before, and there weren't many settlements along the way. The road had long become a dirt track and then disappeared into dense thickets. Trees closed in on her from both sides, as if peering at who dared to disturb their peace. Mary desperately needed to use the bathroom, and she attempted to convey this to her stepmother with inarticulate sounds. At first, her stepmother ignored her, but then, realizing that the cursed girl might ruin her seats, she stopped and forcibly pulled Mary out of the car. Well, go ahead. What are you waiting for? There's no one here. She pointed directly to the road, but Mary, shaking her head, nodded at the thick bushes. Oh, how shy we are. The stepmother mockingly declared. Fine, go into the bushes if you want to stick your butt out. I'll stay here by the car. Hurry up. Mary, confirming that her stepmother had sat right on the road, crawled into the bushes. This is my chance, a crazy thought flashed through her mind. She then ran as fast as she could into the depths of the forest, squeezing through branches and shrubs like a cornered deer. You little wretch. Her stepmother yelled in pursuit. But it was too late, and Mary gained a slight lead. Besides, fear gave her speed, and she ran and ran and ran. Her stepmother's voice grew fainter, staying somewhere behind, and then she lost her strength, collapsing face first into the soft moss. This was what saved her. By some miracle, she had run into the very center of a swamp without sinking into the quagmire, jumping from one island to another, which remained firm on the surface. A log knocked down in her haste had gone under, and by the time the gasping ant reached the spot, the swamp had closed over her with a loud squelch. Her stepmother scrutinized the chain of tracks left by the fugitive, then looked at the place where something had gone under. She didn't drown. That's your way, you rich. She spat into the grass, scowling with anger, and went back towards the car. 
Mary didn't hear her words. She had lost consciousness. She woke up to find herself inexplicably wet. The girl opened her eyes and nearly screamed in horror. The mound she lay on was slowly sinking into the swamp. Mary froze, afraid to move and provoke it further. In class, they taught her that you should grab onto a branch or rely on a stick when stuck in the swamp. But there was neither of those here. I think I'm going to die now, she thought with a strange sense of relief. Better that way than at the hands of her wicked stepmother. However, she didn't want to give up hope, so she attempted to crawl away. Unfortunately, she immediately sank deeper into the muck. Mary whimpered, struggling and smearing the sticky mud with her hands. Suddenly, a shadow appeared on the other side of the swamp, moving towards her. Two yellow eyes gleamed in the distance. A wolf flashed through the girl's mind. She was so frightened that she stopped waving her arms and prepared to drown. But the shaggy shadow, moving purposefully and breathing loudly, was already close. Perhaps it's a dog after all? Mary wondered. She didn't have time to think, and she grabbed onto the animal's fur. Her unexpected savior yelped and pulled her out, squirming in her grip. Sensing the swamp relenting, Mary clutched the creature's neck and began to crawl out of the muck. Both of them were gasping for breath, but Mary's savior growled and bit her hand, not too hard, but enough for her to feel its teeth. Somehow, Mary sensed what it wanted from her and followed it, carefully retracing her steps. Occasionally, the beast looked back as if to check if she was still there. The journey through the swamp felt like an eternity, and Mary couldn't believe it when she managed to grab onto a branch and pull herself onto dry land. She lay on her back and closed her eyes. It seemed she had lost consciousness again, as she opened her eyes only when she felt a rough tongue against her cheeks. The creature was nearby, breathing heavily. It did indeed resemble a wolf, although Mary had only seen them in the zoo or in pictures. Well, now he's going to eat me, Mary thought with a strange indifference. Such overwhelming sadness had taken over her that she had no desire to live or move at all. Nevertheless, she lifted her head and gazed into the creature's eyes. Somewhere, she had heard or read that animals couldn't stand a direct human gaze. Apparently, this one didn't get the memo since it looked straight at her, almost reproachfully. Then it turned around and trotted into the thicket, glancing back. At first, Mary didn't understand what it wanted, and she even felt a glimmer of hope. Perhaps it was full, or she looked unappetizing. In that case, there was a chance that the creature would run away, and she could get up and walk away. But where will I go? She asked herself. I don't even know which way the road is. I'm about to get completely lost, and then I'll probably encounter someone less discerning who will definitely devour me. In the meantime, the creature, seeing that the girl was still standing still, let out an irritated growl and returned. Mary flinched. When it grabbed the edge of her wet jacket and started pulling, she moved, indicating that she understood. What difference does it make, she thought. I'll follow it. Maybe it really knows the way to people, and it's not trying to lead me to its lair to keep me as a snack. Her doubts were dispelled when, after half an hour of incessant whining through the branches, they reached a clearing in the middle of the forest. There stood a small hut that only seemed to lack gnarled branches on the roof, Mary thought. Still, her love for fairy tales surfaced, even in these critical situations. The creature approached the dwelling and emitted a raspy sound that resembled a growl. It fell silent for a minute, and Mary pondered whether she should escape. Is that you, forest spirit? A voice emerged from the hut. Are you hungry, wanderer? The door swung open, revealing an enormous man who, to the frightened girl, looked like a forest ranger or a hunter. Her thoughts raced in her head like panicked squirrels, but now she was afraid to even take a step. 
What was the point anyway? In the end, either one or the other would catch up with her. Who have you brought with you? The man asked in bewilderment, surveying Mary, who was trembling from fear and cold. Did you pull her out of the swamp? The forest spirit let out an affirmative growl and whimpered, as if to say, I'm freezing too, can't you see? Who are you? The man asked as he towered over Mary. He was indeed well over six feet tall, and Mary could only look at him by tilting her head back. She moved, gesturing to her mouth, and shook her head. And mute too, the man exclaimed. Where did you come from? Mary burst into tears. After all, she had experienced enough shocks today. No use wetting everything, you're already soaking wet. Grumbled the man. Come inside the hut. My shirt is on the bench. Take off your wet clothes and put it on. While you change into dry clothes, I'll deal with this shaggy. Mary, shivering, entered the small hut. Inside, it was warm and smelled of herbs. She removed her wet clothes and found a warm shirt. She wrapped herself in it like a dress, buttoned it up completely, and climbed onto the bench with her bare feet. She closed the door, and the man returned, taking a look at the pile of wet rags that had once been her clothing. Go get the warm felt boots from the stove, and don't shake like that. I don't eat small ones like you. In the hut, there was indeed a small but effective stove. When Mary looked at it, she discovered a pair of warm felt boots. She put them on and felt a blissful warmth. Peering out the window, she saw the man drying the fur of the creature that had saved her with some kind of cloth. Then he put something in a dish and gave it to the creature. Mary hoped it wasn't some stew made from another lost girl. Strangely, after warming up, she stopped being afraid. Apparently, her limit of fear had been reached, and now indifference had taken its place. Well, what else could happen? Would the man turn out to be a maniac or a rapist? Well, then she would start thinking about it, but for now, she was very hungry. After some contemplation, Mary approached the table and saw a newspaper with a crossword puzzle next to it, along with a pencil. Apparently, the local hermit had some connection to the outside world, as he was interested in the news. But what made her happiest was the pencil. She wrote on the margins of the newspaper, My name is Mary. I lost my voice because of my stepmother. She tried to kill me. After thinking, Mary added, I'm very hungry. Taking the newspaper with her, the girl went into the yard. Both the man and the creature turned to look at the creaking door. So, what do you have there? The man looked at the newspaper, read her scribbles, and let out an astonished whistle. Leshy, look at this. It's a whole thriller here. You're not making this up, are you? He directed this question to Mary. She shook her head. Well, what do you think, Leshy? Should we believe her? The man turned to the creature. The creature made a short sound, as if confirming the story. Well, you've had quite an adventure, the man muttered, examining the girl. Mary lowered her head, realizing that she looked like a complete scarecrow in her oversized shirt and mismatched felt boots. All right, first, we need to feed you. Shall we have a bath like in the tales? The man grinned. As if remembering something, he added, So, you're Mary, right? The girl nodded. You're already acquainted with Leshy, the man continued. Hearing his name, the creature growled. And how come you weren't scared of him? You probably thought he was a wolf, right? Mary nodded again. He is a wolf, the man chuckled. I rescued him as a little cub from a trap, and now we're living together like two peas in a pod. Call me Kevin. I'm sort of the forest ranger around here. Mary nodded and said, nice to meet you. Kevin added food to Leshy's bowl and nodded at Mary. Let's go, 
I'll feed you with what God has sent us. The soup should still be warm. With a smile of relief, the girl followed him into the hut. After rummaging by the stove, Kevin took out a cast iron pot, poured the stew into two large bowls, added a spoon, and a couple of slices of bread. Eat, he pointed at Mary's bowl. Don't worry, it's rabbit stew. We don't eat little girls here, my stomach can't handle it. And he chuckled, seemingly pleased with his own joke. Mary, hesitating, smiled as well and took the spoon. The stew turned out to be incredibly delicious, or she was just so hungry that she would have eaten an entire pot of it now. As she savored the food, she secretly examined Kevin's face. He's not that old, she thought. Not a grandpa, more like a father's age. Thoughts about her father brought tears to her eyes, and she choked up. Hey, none of that here. The cabin's owner raised his voice. I can't stand all that female fuss. Frightened by his displeasure, Mary stopped crying and continued eating in silence. Her tears had dried up on their own. What kind of monster would harm a child? Kevin reflected. And why didn't your father intervene? Mary raised her eyes to him, sighed, and shook her head, folding her hands over her chest. What? Neither mom nor dad. The forest ranger exclaimed. Oh, you poor thing. But don't be afraid of me. I've got a daughter your age, if... Well, never mind. He waved his hand and concentrated on his meal. Mary finished everything to the last drop, wiped her plate with a crust of bread, and looked at Kevin, questioning what's next. What's next? He got her message right. You'll take a bath now. The basin is outside. There's hot water in the cauldron. I'll get everything for you. Just be careful. Mary rolled up the shirt sleeve to reveal a burn scar. Who did this to you? Kevin gasped. Was it your stepmother? Mary nodded. Kevin's face darkened. He mumbled something to himself, and Mary only caught one word, sort it out. Go wash up. Lest she will keep an eye on you, the forest ranger ordered. Given a bucket of hot water, a towel, soap, and a pair of huge shorts with the elastic pulled tight by Kevin to make them stay on her waist, Mary headed for the wash. There she found a tub and a barrel of rainwater. As she washed, she felt like she was cleansing not just the dirt, but also the fears and the tension of the past few years. Leshy's head popped out from behind the house, and it seemed like the wolf was smiling. With a dignified air, he approached her and lay down, guarding her while she bathed. Mary washed herself diligently, then dried off, got dressed, and sat down next to her guardian. She stroked his dry fur and muttered words of thanks, and she believed that at this moment, in Kevin's cabin, she was safer than she had ever been in her childhood home. How are you, finished with your water procedures? Kevin asked from around the corner. Instead of Mary, it was Leshy who responded, lifting his head, he let out an affirmative roar. The forester, making sure that his uninvited guest was dressed and had even managed to retrieve her clothes from the wet pile, stretched them, and hanged them out to dry, grunted, and sat a little further away. What should I do with you, huh? He asked, not so much Mary as himself. Do you have any family? The girl shook her head negatively. That's not good, the man pondered. In a good way, we should send you back to the city and file a lawsuit against your stepmother. Mary looked at him with frightened eyes. I just don't believe in our most just court in the world for some reason, Kevin shrugged. It could get worse. Besides, while they figure it out, they'll place you in a shelter, don't go to the fortune teller. And it's not pleasant there. And what's left? Mary anxiously awaited his decision. I can't stay with you either, Kevin continued. 
It's not right for a young lady to live with an old recluse. It's not good, and I'm used to being alone. Mary's lips trembled. She thought that Kevin was about to say that the shelter would be the best option for her. But, but, we agreed not to make it damp. The forester frowned, and lest she looked at her with reproach, it was said that they would come up with something. He clearly didn't know how to deal with a foundling. Leshy, settled on the grass, observed with obvious irony as his friend, sending Mary into the hut, paced in circles, grumbling to himself, muttering half aloud. Is this like the saying the woman without worries bought a pig? Kevin mused, addressing Leshy. I can't kick her out, nowhere to send her. Where is the police? And who even knows them? The law, what a joke. It's not an option for the girl to stay here, and I'm not a babysitter. One thing remains. He brightened as he made a decision. I'll take you to Granny Karen. She's a witch doctor. Maybe she can help you get your voice back. And don't look at me like that, he shouted at Leshy, even though Leshy remained silent. I know her temperament isn't the easiest, but at least she's a woman. Well, at least formally. Leshy lifted one ear and covered his nose with a paw. It seemed like he was chuckling. All right, go ahead, laugh at me. Kevin threatened him with his finger. By the way, this is your responsibility since you're the one who brought the girl from the swamp. Leshy looked at him with reproach, as if to say, why didn't you leave the child there? Okay, stop giving me that look. So, it's settled, we're going to Karen's. Mary sat on a bench, examining the interior of the hut. Although, what kind of interior was there? A stove, a bench, a table, a chest, a window without curtains. On the walls, various wreaths made of different herbs were hung, along with various tools needed for household chores, that's it. It's clear that the owner lives alone. She'll kick me out, for sure. Or give me back to my aunt, Mary sadly reflected. These thoughts made her feel cold, and she wrapped herself tightly in her shirt. For some reason, she had completely stopped being afraid of this wild-looking man. She felt that people like him would never harm her. That's how her dad had been, strong, brave, and kind. Mary dropped her face onto her folded arms on the table and cried out loud. The girl didn't hear when Kevin entered the room and sat beside her, gently stroking her back with his broad hand. Don't cry, little one. Life is such that tears won't help. I've been thinking, he continued. Mary hushed, listening to his voice. Do you like fairy tales? The forester asked and she thought she could hear a smile in his voice. Mary raised her head and nodded. Then you must know about Baba Yaga, right? Mary's eyes widened even more, but she nodded again. I have a friend who lives nearby, in a village not far from here. Although, she's the only one left from that village's residence. Her name is Granny Karen. Not because of her age, even though she's old, but out of respect. She's a powerful witch doctor. People come to her from many miles away. She's quite temperamental. She'll heal some for free and refuse others even for a lot of money. I'm sure she can cure your muteness. Mary listened, holding her breath. It really felt like a fairy tale. However, it was frightening to go to some old woman. What if she turned out to be as wicked as her stepmother? She had grown somewhat accustomed to Kevin. We and Leshy will visit you, Kevin continued. She once cured me as well, and I thought I'd never recover. Now, I help her in any way I can, fix things around her house, tend to her yard. Neighbors, so to speak. Agree, Mary. There's a chance you'll start speaking again. Mary nodded hesitantly. That's settled. Kevin exclaimed. You stay here. Here's a crossword puzzle you can solve, and I'll gather some gifts for Karen. 
We can't go empty-handed when we ask for help. Besides, your clothes will dry. He left her alone with her thoughts. Mary couldn't sit still. The future frightened her. She looked around and found a broom, then started sweeping the floor. Afterward, not thinking of anything better to do, she wiped the window with a piece of cloth and cleaned the dust. Eventually, she lay down on the bench and fell asleep. Are you tired, hostess? Kevin's voice woke her up. Mary opened her eyes and timidly smiled at him. He didn't seem as scary now. Her stepmother, for all her pretense, had turned out to be a real witch. But this huge man living in the forest with his tamed wolf hadn't done anything to harm her. He had fed her and even promised to help her recover. Look at the order you've created. Kevin looked around. Thank you. Don't be offended. I can't leave you here. It's not right. And what kind of caretaker am I, you know? Mary nodded hesitantly. He was saying the right things, but she had already been through so much fear, and now she didn't know what to expect. Don't drift away, Kevin encouraged her. I've gathered gifts. If you've rested, it's time to hit the road. Mary sighed. Lest she peered into the partly open door, making a sound resembling encouraging silence, as if to say, we'll get through this. Here, hold this bag with gifts, Kevin handed her a woven sack filled with berries. Karen has a sweet tooth, it won't hurt to butter her up a bit. He had packed various odds and ends into a backpack, apparently also as gifts for the mysterious Granny Karen. Then he took Mary's hand, and together, accompanied by Leshy, they set off down the path. Mary looked around with curiosity. Now, with the huge and strong Kevin by her side and the faithful Leshy close by, life didn't seem so bleak. Besides, on both sides of the path, blueberry bushes were starting to appear. Soon, she was thoroughly covered in berry juice, and every time Kevin, who towered above her, looked down at her, he would chuckle, hiding a smile in his mustache. Nevertheless, when the forest suddenly ended and they arrived at a row of very dilapidated cottages, the girl became frightened and gripped Kevin's broad hand even tighter. You promised to be brave, didn't you? Kevin smiled encouragingly, and Mary, taking a deep breath, straightened up and tried to stop trembling. Granny Karen lived in the farthest cottage, the one closest to the forest. However, as Mary would later find out, it was the only inhabited house. The owners of the others were no longer around, some had left, and some remained forever in the graveyard. The village and its resident which would have been completely forgotten if it weren't for the reputation of the healer, which had spread for many miles around. Granny Karen, open up. Kevin shouted, using his hands as a makeshift megaphone. Inside, Mary felt her heart clench, and she tried to hide behind her savior's broad back. Meanwhile, the door creaked, and out into the light crawled. Baba Yaga, or at least that's how Mary imagined her. She was wearing a long skirt and a tattered shawl, despite the summer heat. Mary shivered and started to withdraw her hand, but Kevin held her firmly. Is that you, Kevin? The witch asked in a creaky voice. It's me. Who else? Kevin confirmed. Leshy cleared his throat briefly. Apparently, that was his version of a bark. And who's with you? Baba Karen covered her forehead with her hand as if shading her eyes. Mary felt as if this strange character was peering right through her. I found her in the woods, Kevin shrugged. She can't talk, only wrote that her stepmother abandoned her in the forest. She's not lying, Granny Karen rendered her verdict. I can spot a lie from a mile away, but this little girl truly got the short end of the stick. What do you want from me? Please, heal the girl, Kevin requested, placing the trembling Mary in front of him. She's not mute by nature, it's out of fear. 
Can you help her? I might be able to. Karen kept her gaze fixed on the pale girl. Now Tasha was imagining what would happen when Kevin went into the woods, leaving them alone with the witch. It's hard to compete with fear. She's afraid of me even now. Are you scared, for example? She turned to Mary. Mary, after some thought, nodded. You see, Grandma Karen shrugged. Nothing will come of it. Let the doctors treat her. The child needs to be sent to the city, to a good hospital. We can't send her to the city, Kevin said, shaking his head. They'll likely put her in an orphanage, or her stepmother will take her back sooner or later. She might even harm the child. Maybe they won't, Karen squinted, if the proper authorities keep an eye on her. You have connections there, don't you? Mary felt Kevin freeze suddenly. We won't discuss that, he said, sounding hushed but making Grandma Karen drop her teasing tone. Will you take care of the girl, or do I have to take her back to the forest? Grandma remained silent for a moment, then pursed her lips. You're a fool, Kevin. Well, it's your business. Even I wouldn't treat her. She finally said, Okay, I'll see what can be done, leave the girl. Mary trembled, and Kevin let out a sigh of relief. Thank you, God bless you. He said emotionally, I brought some gifts from the forest, enjoy. Grandma Karen's eyes twinkled, but her expression remained stern. Unload the gifts in the barn. She ordered, And you, dear, come to me, she said unexpectedly tenderly to the girl. Go on, go on, I don't eat children, and my teeth aren't what they used to be. Mary felt like she might be winking, although it was hard to tell from that distance. Kevin nudged her towards the porch and followed Grandma into the house. The girl hesitated, standing by the porch. Should I run back to the forest? The mischievous thought crossed her mind again. And then she felt the leshy nudge her with its nose, as if urging her to obey. Mary turned and looked at the creature. It was whimpering, trying to wag its tail, and it seemed to be smiling. Deciding it was a definite sign, Mary, taking a deep breath, climbed the creaky steps onto the porch and opened the door. Inside, it was interesting. She couldn't find another word for it immediately because her eyes were darting in all directions. And there was plenty to see, as this house seemed to host the most extraordinary things. For example, a samovar and a laptop, bundles of herbs on the walls, and numerous flasks similar to the ones Mary had seen in her chemistry class. Upon seeing the girl's astonished expression, Kevin and Grandma Karen burst into laughter. That's me, a modern-day Baba Yaga, the witch proclaimed proudly, surveying her laboratory. Don't judge me by the fact that I live in the woods. I chose it myself, to get away from the hustle and closer to nature. Karen defended her doctorate in herbs, and not just one, Kevin added. People come from all over the country for consultations and treatment with her. She even got me back on my feet once. She got you back on your feet, but didn't fix your brain. Grandma Karen grumbled. Kevin tried to say something, but she cut off the conversation. And since you don't want to listen to anything, our conversation will be brief. Leave the girl and go on your way. We'll sort this out without you. Kevin laughed again, winked at Mary, as if to say, look how tough she is, and began to prepare to leave. Sitting down beside the girl, he wiped away her involuntary tears and said, Don't be afraid. Listen to Grandma Karen. She won't let anything happen to you. The less she and I will come visit you soon, you'll see. By that time, you'll even start talking. Still, the girl turned pale, being left alone with Grandma Karen. The old woman observed her closely, then approached and hugged her shoulders tightly. I can see life has been hard on you, leaving you with little faith in people. 
just like Kevin when we first met him here in the woods. He came here to die, among other things. I healed his body, but I couldn't heal his soul. Now, I look at you, and I wonder, maybe this is your purpose. Mary stared at the old woman, bewildered. All right, let's have a tea party. We'll put these berries to good use. Do you like berries? Mary nodded instinctively, and Karen chuckled while looking at the girl's messy mouth and hands. It's obvious. Look in the cupboard over there, Grandma Karen encouraged Mary. Mary reached out, opened the door, and gasped. There stood a complete set of unimaginably beautiful porcelain teacups, delicate and transparent. Bring them over. They're meant for practical use, not just admiration, Grandma Karen urged her. Still, Mary handled the teacups carefully with two fingers, fearing to damage such wonders. However, the tea tasted a hundred times better in them, especially with crushed berries. It had the aroma of summer steeped in a teapot. With every sip, the girl felt her breathing becoming easier, her fears and worries slipping away. Mary looked up at the old woman sitting across from her. She was smiling. So, how's the tea? Magical, isn't it? Grandma Karen asked. Mary nodded and timidly smiled in response. Do you know about living water? Grandma Karen continued the leisurely conversation. Well, we have it right here. It helps not everyone, only the good and kind. And those who are willing to heal themselves. Are you ready? Mary nodded again. She liked this fairy tale like Grandma, even though she seemed like a Baba Yaga at first. Good, Grandma Karen approved. We'll finish our tea, clean up the dishes, and then we'll start driving the sickness out of you. Mary looked a bit wary. She wondered how they were going to drive the sickness out of her. However, after thinking it over, she decided not to be afraid. It couldn't be worse than living with her stepmother. After clearing the table and washing the dishes in a large basin, they headed down a path through the field. Mary walked alongside Grandma Karen, admiring the wild herbs and flowers. With Karen's approving glance, she wove a beautiful wreath for herself and placed it on her head. You look beautiful, her companion complimented her, and Mary felt her spirits lift. Maybe everything will be fine, just like in a fairy tale. Right now, she wanted to believe in that. The path led to a river lined with water lilies. Clouds drifted through the crystal clear water all the way to the bottom. Mary couldn't help but gaze at them, feeling just as light and free. Grandma Karen was the first to shed her shirt and skirt, revealing a simple nightgown-like garment. She straightened her back and didn't appear as ancient as Mary had initially thought. Feeling somewhat shy, Mary also took off her clothes and dipped her toes into the water. It's cold. B.R.R. Mary exclaimed. Be brave, my girl, or the water might refuse to take the sickness away, Grandma Karen said sternly from behind her. Mary took a step, then another, and suddenly, she was underwater with her head submerged. She flailed her arms, opened her mouth in a silent scream, and a hoarse, high-pitched A-A-A-A emerged from her throat. Grandma Karen, standing just a step away, scooped up handfuls of water and poured it over the girl while murmuring something under her breath. With goose water, let Mary be rid of all her ailments, it sounded to the frightened girl. Then, her fear dissipated instantly. Her breathing evened out, and she found the ground beneath her feet. It turned out she only needed to take one more step. Try to say something, Grandma Karen demanded. Speak. A-A-A, the girl managed to say in a sing-song tone. Her throat didn't cooperate, but now she was certain she would speak again soon. Good job. Grandma Karen praised her. The river accepted you and agreed to help. 
We'll come here every day. You'll see, everything will get better. Mary nodded. She didn't want to leave the water herself. She splashed around a bit near the shore. Here, Grandma Karen tossed her the wreath. Give it to the river as a thank you for healing. Mary stroked the flowers and gently pushed the wreath into the water where the current took it away. The river picked up the gift and carried it away into the distance with the clouds. She watched it with a smile. Right now, she felt so good and the world seemed to shine in new colors, not just dark and cruel. On the shore, her skin was covered in goosebumps and she shivered a bit while resourceful Grandma Karen wrapped her in a large fluffy towel. Returning along the same path was much more cheerful. Mary skipped ahead, picking blades of grass, and behaved like an excited puppy. Grandma Karen smiled as she watched the girl, appearing younger herself. Once inside the cottage, Mary unexpectedly felt hunger. She glanced at Grandma Karen, who was peacefully reading, comfortably seated on the bed. Mary mumbled, trying to get her attention. However, the old woman, either hard of hearing or engrossed in her book, didn't turn her head. Mary approached closer, patted her stomach, and let out a couple more faint sounds. Don't murmur, speak with words, Grandma Karen responded without looking up from her book. Mary felt a deep sense of injustice. How could she speak with words? She didn't know how. So, not so eager, I see, Grandma Karen calmly remarked, noticing her confusion. Mary tensed. Sounds bubbled up in her throat, but they refused to come out. She imagined them as billiard balls, needing an invisible cue to be hit, rolling up her throat. She mentally picked three of these balls and pushed them. I am. She managed to say unexpectedly. Grandma Karen put her book down, dangled her legs off the bed, and patted Mary's head. Well done, she approved. Everything will work out. You just need to try. But for now, it's time to eat. Grab a bowl. Go to the backyard. I have some chickens there. Collect eggs, and we'll fry them with bacon. Oh. It'll be delicious. Still a little disoriented from the experience, Mary went out to the yard. True to Grandma Karen's words, there were colorful chickens and a brightly colored rooster. Ignoring his disapproving clucking, the girl collected five eggs and triumphantly returned home. Well done. Grandma Karen smiled. Soon, the cottage was filled with the mouth-watering aroma of sizzling bacon. The scrambled eggs turned out to be incredibly delicious. Mary scraped the remnants from the plate and closed her eyes in contentment, like a satisfied kitten. However, Grandma Karen didn't seem to share her jubilant mood. She seemed to be listening to something inside herself, then approached the door, opened it, and barely moved aside in time. The leshy burst into the house. The wolf whimpered, pacing around the room, glancing at the door, as if calling someone to follow him. Mary, with terror in her eyes, noticed blood on the leshy's fur. Something happened to Kevin. Grandma Karen cried out. Looks like he ran into poachers. Stay here. I'll call for help. Stay put. However, Mary didn't hear the old woman's shouts behind her. Following the leshy who had rushed out of the house, she sprinted down the same path that Kevin had used to bring her here. The leshy looked back on the way as if checking if she was following. Mary ran with her heart pounding in her chest. The leshy led her to a clearing and howled. Mary, her heart racing, saw a man lying in the grass. She rushed to him, knelt beside him, and tried to turn him over. For a moment, she thought Kevin wasn't breathing. His camouflage pants were soaked with blood, and she got dirty in the process. She continued shaking him, hoping that he was still alive. The less she whined next to them, nudging the man with his snout. 
When Mary had given up all hope of reviving Kevin, a hoarse sound erupted from her throat. Bye-bye. And following the first miracle, a second one occurred. Kevin groaned and turned over, looking at the girl in astonishment. Mary, is that you? Where did you come from? He said with difficulty. Dad. Sobbed Mary, looking at the bloodstained grass. Kevin tried to sit up, but couldn't and winced. They got me, the bastards. Local poachers, they've been threatening for a while. Well, now I've caught a load of buckshot in both legs. Kevin tried to move his legs, but that didn't work either. Mary, I have a knife in my belt bag. Try to cut the trousers and bandage them. The girl composed herself, and her tears dried up on their own. Kevin helped her open the folding knife, and Mary got to work. The sturdy fabric was reluctant to yield, but she managed it. She gasped when she saw what Kevin's legs had turned into below the knees. She looked up at him with widened eyes, in which the man read that things were not looking good. Don't lose heart, daughter. We've been through worse scrapes than this. He encouraged either Mary or himself. The girl startled at such an address. Kevin didn't let her cry again. Cut the fabric into long strips and bandage them as tightly as possible, he asked. I'll try to crawl. In these woods, not only the forest spirit roams, but other beasts as well. And two-legged ones are much more dangerous. Following the wounded man's advice, Mary bound his legs as tightly as she could, and the bleeding stopped, and both breathed a sigh of relief. Rolling over onto his stomach with Mary's help, Kevin attempted to crawl. It was slow, but it was working. When he got tired, they took breaks, and Mary wiped the sweat from his forehead. The forest spirit licked Kevin's pale face with its long tongue and whimpered. We'll make it, I know it, whispered Kevin and kept crawling persistently. It seemed like several hours had passed, although Mary couldn't tell exactly how long. Time had lost all meaning, and then his strength gave out, and he lost consciousness. Mary jumped to her feet, running aimlessly around the clearing, and then a dam broke in her throat, and a cry echoed through the forest, a a a a She was screaming and praying for a miracle, and another miracle happened. The forest was filled with the cracking of branches. A tall woman burst onto the clearing, rushed to Kevin, sat down beside him, and hastily opened a first aid kit. Following her came a massive, gray-haired man in the same camouflage suit as Kevin. Brian, we need to get him to the house as soon as possible. The woman ordered. Looking at Mary, she asked. Run to the house. We need warm water, a lot of it. Do you remember the way? Right next to her, the forest spirit appeared, and Mary followed him, believing, as she noticed the giant picking up Kevin in his arms. Grandma Karen emerged from the forest cabin to meet her. How did she manage to get here? Mary wondered. However, she saw an SUV behind the house. Can this strange old lady even drive? Help us. Grandma ordered, peering into the direction of the forest. They managed to boil water and prepare bandages and cotton when the door swung open, and the enormous Brian, barely fitting through the doorway, carried the moaning Kevin into the house. The woman followed him, and only now did Mary notice how beautiful she was. Simply a fairy tale beauty. Kevin was placed on the table, and both women fussed around him. Let's go, we won't get in the way, Brian's large hand rested on the girl's shoulder. Obeying him, she went out into the yard and only there let her tears flow. She cried, uttering some incoherent syllables, and Brian silently stroked her back, saying, Don't worry about Kevin, honey, he's been through worse scrapes. He saved my life twice, and not just mine. So, the opportunity has presented itself to settle scores. 
We'll catch and punish those bandits. You can be sure of that. Mary gradually calmed down, and her slender shoulders twitched less. Grandma Karen came out of the house, embraced the girl, and spoke affectionately. You're mistaken, Brian. It wasn't us. She saved his life today. I've been saying to Kevin for a while that he'd have a daughter. And it turned out to be true. Has he regained consciousness? Brian asked. Mary felt like they were keeping something from her. Do you want to ask about Rebecca? Grandma Karen chuckled. She won't leave his side. He's still asleep, but they'll talk eventually. Kevin is stubborn. Brian shook his head. He can't forgive Rebecca after all these years. Foolish because, Grandma Karen replied calmly. His mother didn't want to share her son with a bride. She told the girl that she had an abortion, and he believed her. He didn't come back home. He signed a contract. And she, poor thing, had a miscarriage at the time, no fault of hers, I know for sure. And if he hadn't signed, I wouldn't have saved him, Brian sighed. That's the way it worked out. It's fate. Fate, Grandma Karen agreed and unexpectedly brightened like a clear Sunday. Did fate also make you rush to a friend's aid on the first call? It seemed so, Brian nodded. I was at training, I raised a helicopter, and here I am. They were surprised there. And he laughed so loudly that Mary flinched. You'll return and get grounded for insubordination. His sarcastic companion quipped. In response, Brian just raised an eyebrow and said, Well, well, where will they find a second specialist of my level? That's how Rebecca fell for him with the first word, Grandma Karen mused. Kevin got lucky. He got lucky, Brian agreed and glanced at the old woman. Do you think I'll get lucky someday? You're at it again. Grandma Karen exclaimed. Brian, I'm already old, and you keep proposing. You're eight years younger than me. You're such a handsome man, you'll find yourself a young one. Nah, Karen, I don't need a young one. Brian shook his gray head. I need a loved one. Oh, why are we starting this with a child present? Grandma Karen gasped, and Mary, greatly surprised, saw how young her eyes shone. The door opened, and the pale Rebecca stepped toward them. Is he awake? Grandma Karen asked, looking into her face. Yes, Rebecca replied with her lips barely moving. He kicked me out, and she covered her face with her hands. All right. Karen stood up resolutely on the go, tossing to Brian, watch over the girls here, and I'll go clear the stubborn guy's head. I won't tolerate him breaking lives, his and the girls. Brian embraced the crying Rebecca and Mary, after a thought, came up from behind, hugging her and leaning against her with her whole body, comforting the unhappy woman. Come on, be quiet and listen. A voice came from the house, and they all flinched. We didn't bring you back from the other side for you to ruin lives for yourself and that girl. They didn't hear Kevin's response, but something in the house clearly broke. Then there was only indistinct conversation, and half an hour later, a clearly satisfied Grandma Karen came out again. Rebecca, go into the house. You need to talk. She ordered in a tone that brooked no objections. Rebecca, looking helplessly at Mary, went into the house. Grandma took her place and winked at the girl. Don't worry, they'll work it out. They have even more in common now than at the beginning. So, they'll definitely reach an understanding. While Brian, to calm his nerves and find something to do, chopped wood behind the house, the elderly woman and the girl sat close together, waiting for something. Then Grandma nodded. All right, we can go in. She entered first and froze in the doorway, blocking the entrance. Then she cleared her throat and remarked mischievously. 
You'll have plenty of time for cuddling. You have your whole life ahead of you. But for now, a cup of tea would be just right. The blushing Rebecca stepped away from Kevin, who was already lying on the bed, got busy setting the table. Nothing reminded them that he had recently been turned into an operating table. Kevin lay quietly. He had a profoundly contemplative look, but his eyes were full of tenderness as he watched Rebecca. When she cautiously fed him tea, Mary noticed that Kevin's hand was caressing Rebecca's hand. First aid has been provided. Now we need to go to the hospital, Grandma Karen said in a tone that brooked no objections. All right, I'm on it. Brian exclaimed happily. But she shook her head. I think they can handle it there now, especially since we need to decide what to do with the girl. We've already decided. Kevin looked at Mary and smiled. After all, you didn't call me dad in the forest just for show, did you? You won't abandon me when I'm helpless and injured, will you? Mary shook her head and said with some difficulty. No. Grandma Karen looked at Rebecca and grinned. Well, Rebecca, what do you say? It seems we'll have to use our official status for once. After all, you're our authorized representative for children's rights, aren't you? Rebecca nodded and looked at Kevin with a slight challenge. Yes, I still am. And I know exactly how to deal with those who try to harm children. That settled, then, Karen took the initiative. Apparently, being in command was a familiar task for her. Rebecca, we'll get our wounded friend into the jeep, you'll take the girl, and you'll sort things out with the guardian. And if she doesn't understand the language, we'll step in with the boys. Brian chuckled, glancing sideways at the commanding lady. I don't think it will be necessary, but thanks for the offer, Rebecca replied. She didn't take her eyes off Kevin, holding Mary close. Once you're ready, you'll still need to go to the hospital. Karen continued. Brian, you can head back. Otherwise, they might really send troops in search of the heroic colonel. No need for troops, Brian thoughtfully stated. However, I have another unfinished business here. And he gave an expressive glance at Grandma Karen. Don't even think about it. She exclaimed, waving her hands. You're not a vigilante for crying out loud. This is a matter for the police. Don't meddle. Oh, come on, woman. Brian said, his thick gray eyebrows almost meeting in the middle. They hurt my friend, which means they hurt me. Do you think I'm going to run to the police and complain? I've said it, I'll handle it myself. Surprisingly, Grandma Karen fell silent. It's time for us to go. Rebecca looked at Mary and asked, You're coming with us, right? The girl nodded, then gathered her courage and said, Yes. I told you that treatment would help. Kevin smiled. And don't get too cheeky. Grandma Karen, it seemed, was getting back some of her lost grumpiness. So it will heal before the wedding. Before their wedding or ours? Brian interjected, and Mary was amazed to see that the remarkable witch could indeed blush. Deciding that the adults needed to prepare, and that she had nothing except what she was wearing, she rushed to hug the leash. The wolf licked her cheeks with its rough tongue, as if understanding that they would soon be separated. Leash, the girl struggled to say. It's all right, dear. You'll negotiate with all of us yet. Grandma Karen smiled. And then they first drove along a country road, then on a highway, with Kevin's head resting on Mary's lap. She stroked his hair, pleading with someone up there. You're the strongest, the smartest, and you already have my real mom and dad. Leave Kevin for me, don't take him. I'll be very, very obedient. I'll help them with Rebecca in everything. Just make him better. Apparently, the child's plea was heard. 
Kevin quickly recovered, although he did lose a lot of blood. But he was indeed fortunate. Help arrived in time. While he was in the hospital, Brian had taken care of him, and Mary had lived with Rebecca. Rebecca took care of her affairs, being so considerate of the girl's psyche that she didn't even have to meet the hated stepmother. Mary learned by chance that the young man had run away from the wicked aunt, who returned without the girl and offered a vague explanation of what had happened. He filed for divorce. Apparently, he had some remnants of conscience left after all, unlike Aunt Emily, who denied everything until they showed her the recording of Mary's story. Rebecca did her best to ensure that the punishment was as severe as possible. There was no direct evidence of an attempt on the child's life, but the law hit the cunning woman where it hurt the most, her wallet, imposing a hefty fine. Of course, there was no question of guardianship, so Rebecca, indeed, pulled all the strings to offer her own candidacy for adoption. With excellent assistance, her request was granted. When Kevin was discharged from the hospital, he and Rebecca submitted their documents to the registrar's office. By that time, Mary, not being a naive child, had already realized from the conversations that Kevin and Rebecca had always loved each other. Only the interference of Kevin's mother had separated the destined couple. At that time, she was brutally punished by life itself when her son, shocked by his beloved's apparent betrayal, believing she had gotten rid of their child, went off on a military contract and never returned from yet another business trip. The woman had not found peace and had fallen seriously ill. Grandma Karen, who was much younger at the time but just as sharp-tongued, tried to get her back on her feet. That's when the truth came out, but it was too late. The mother died without seeing her son again and without ever absolving herself of her sin. Only many years later did everything fall into place. Rebecca and Kevin visited the graves of the girl's parents soon after he regained consciousness. In that time, they managed to erect a monument in the cemetery. Even the faces in the photographs seemed to come to life and look at the girl. I love you, Mary whispered, carefully placing flowers on the ground. And I'll always love you. Don't worry, now Kevin and Rebecca are with me. You won't mind if I call them mom and dad, will you? And now I also have Grandma Karen and Grandpa Brian. They got married too, but then they had a big fight. Grandpa wanted her to come live with him, but she refused to leave the woods. So, he moved to live with her. He gets taken to work by helicopter. That's the right thing to do, or else who will Leash stay with? We'll be going to them soon, don't miss me. I'll come to you often and tell you everything. Oh, you don't know. I was completely, completely mute, but now everything is fine. Mom and Dad smiled at their daughter from the photo. Mary raised her eyes to the sky, the sun, and the clouds. She had always believed in happy endings in fairy tales, and it seemed that her own personal fairy tale had indeed ended happily, or rather, it was just the beginning of her long and happy life. 